So I'm going to I'm going to share the screen. So you can see them. And feel free to uh, just listen or to read. I'm going to chant the Pali. Pali is uh, the language, one of the languages spoken at the time of the Buddha. It's the language of the early Buddhist teachings, um, the canon of early Buddhist teachings. And so, uh, so I'm gonna chant them in that language. And, um, and so just participate in whatever way feels appropriate for you. So as we, as we honor the Buddha and take refuge in the three precepts, we're, we're placing ourselves in the lineage uh, of these teachings, this 2,600 year old lineage of teachings. Uh, and, um, and it's even said that uh, the Buddha, uh, he didn't invent these teachings the way it's understood in, in, the, uh, in Buddhism is that um, Shakyamuni Buddha rediscovered the teachings that the understanding is that there have actually been Buddhas in other, um, in other times, in other places. So, so it's, there's a sense of that these teachings have been alive, you know, for time out of mind time, a duration of time that's beyond our understanding. And that, you know, just as the Buddha rediscovered them within his own being, so we can also rediscover them within ourselves. They're somehow alive and present within us. Uh, and it's a kind of like coming home to this inner wisdom that we all have. And so, and so as we pay homage, one of the things that I often think of um, as I pay homage and I, I you know, sing this or chant this honoring the Buddha is, you know, what, what do I normally pay homage to in my life? You know, like, what do I respect? Um, and what is, what is kind of held up as you know, worthy of respect in our culture, you know, what are the, you know, is it celebrity or is it power, you know, and 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 there and this is alive in me and on all of us. I think we all want to be recognized and celebrated. So it's and then you know, so where is my deepest homage, my deepest respect? And uh, so, and I think of the quality of being the Buddha. And like, okay, that's where I want to sort of focus my deepest respect. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa And then the idea of going for refuge, you know, that going for refuge to the Buddha there's this sense of, well, when do we go for refuge, right? When we feel that we're somehow in danger, that we need a safe place. And um, yeah, and we can feel that very often in our lives that we feel, you know, like out of balance and we feel um, that we've lost connection with ourselves, that we don't know what's true. We don't know what's right. Uh, we feel like we're, acting out in ways that don't feel good. <laughs> and so, so remembering, so going for refuge is something that we can do at any moment. 
um, and, and we do it at the beginning of our formal practice um, to remind ourselves that it's that that refuge is available to us. Buddham Saranam Gachami Tamang Saranam Gachami Sarnam Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Damang Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Damang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Sangam Saranam Gachami So taking the five precepts, training in peaceful conduct, um, this is uh, part of sila, which is part of the Buddhist path. And, um, and so these precepts are stated in terms of what we refrain from doing, what we train ourselves to refrain from doing. Um, and as we read it and consider it and contemplate it. And I'm gonna pause after each one for a few seconds. You can also think about, you know, it's not only refraining from destroying life, but also how can I support life? How can I support the, uh, the quality of life you know, for myself and all beings? Hanati pata wera mani siga padam samadiyami. Adina dana wera mani siga padam samadiyami. About to pause. Pause. <laughs> Kame su mi cha tara wera mani si ka padam samadiyami. Musa wada wera mani si ka padam samadiyami. Sura Maraya Maja Pama Datana Veramani Sika Padam Sama Deyami Gidam Misilam Maga Fala Nyanasa Pachayo Ho Tu Sadhu, 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 anumodami. So as we begin, let's just become aware of how the body is being supported by the earth. It's 
we can just bring that sense of trusting, relaxing into, letting go into that support. That simple and direct way that we can know that we are supported. We are received. And I invite you to welcome your whole being into this practice and welcome the whole Sangha into your, into your shared space. It's a particular kind of space, it's virtual space. And, and there is this sense that we are here together in this mysterious meaning of here that we've gotten so used to. We're here together with all our vulnerabilities, with all our beautiful qualities, with all the wisdom, the sensitivity of heart, with all the habits that continue to thrust us into suffering, with an accepting heart, a forgiving heart, a cherishing heart. Compassionate heart. arriving fully as we are in this moment. And you can, you can inquire What am I bringing to this sitting in this moment? What energies, what mental states, what physical sensations, perhaps some discomfort in the body or, or perhaps a sense of balance, perhaps a sense of ease. What am I bringing in this moment? What's present in this moment as I begin this practice? Without judging, that's the quality of sati, of mindfulness. It's not that we're showing up in a certain way, but in order to bring our full self to this practice, full being. Part of it is knowing, knowing what is present. Oh, anxiety. Mm. Okay, have a seat. 
sadness. You're welcome too. There's space for you. Kindness, appreciation, welcome. Insecurity, self-doubt. It's okay, no worries, come on in. So we can be the space, the space of, of knowing, of receiving these different manifestations of life that show up, that are part of who we are. We don't need to feel that we are any of these, even the beautiful ones, because if we think that we are peace, that we are kindness, if it is not there in a particular moment, not showing up, we might feel there's something wrong with us. So all of these are qualities, characteristics, of mind, of body that come and go. And in our practice, we learn to be that sense, that quality of knowing. That's an orientation toward freedom not being hooked or identified, but just knowing, being mindful of what's arising and passing. And the breath can help Keep us anchored in the present moment. Just feeling the breath in the body. The body can be our home base. <clears throat> Just a general sense of the body breathing. The whole body breathing. We don't need to narrow our focus on a particular point where we feel the breath. Although if you find that helpful, that's okay to do that. So the rising and falling of the breath known in the body as a kind of um, a rhythm, like a drum beat calling you back to this moment.
doesn't always have to be in the foreground. It can be in the background sometimes. Sometimes if you're noticing a particular pattern of thought that's coming up, you're getting drawn into worrying or narrating or imagining. And just that rising and falling of the breath known in the background or in the periphery can help to not get really pulled in and lost in that thought or fantasy.
during the practice, we can remember to bring that quality of inquiry. What's, what's present? What's present in the mind and the body in this moment? The word sati, which is the Pali word that has been translated as mindfulness, has a, this meaning of remembering, remembering, remembering to be present, remembering to notice, remembering to pay attention. And sati has this quality also in the practice of not judging, not preferring or excluding. And so we remember and we notice with a quality of openness, warmth, kindness. What's happening? What's the mind doing? What's the mind up to? Happening in the body. What's happening in body and mind together? Is the body manifesting something that the mind is resisting? Is the mind manifesting something that the mind is judging? Hmm. Interesting. Does it feel very familiar, this pattern of whatever's happening in the mind and then judging it? something that we do all the time, or a lot. It's important to know that if it's true. And then there can be the letting go. Oh, I have the capacity to let go of this. This doesn't have to overtake me, overcome me, this worrying or self-judgment. So how do I let go? Well, one way that helps us to let go is to transfer our attention back to the breath, back to this very simple moment by moment experience. So I can transfer my attention from this this drivenness that I may get caught up in to something that just grounds me in the moment. And I can come back to the simplicity of just this moment, this body, this breath, this sound. Even this thought, if we don't take our thoughts so seriously, we can just say, oh, there's this thought that popped into my mind, comes and goes. I don't have to believe it. It's just a thought. I didn't make it happen. I didn't want it to happen. It just popped in there. And it can just drift away if I don't hold on to it. So discovering the power of letting go. It's also very much a part of our meditation practice. It's 
one of the secrets to the path to freedom is recognizing that we have the capacity to let go. So as we come to the end of the sitting practice, I invite you to bring to mind and, and to body memory, to uh, connection in the body, the moments of openness, presence, acceptance, calmness that you might have touched during this practice. And maybe, maybe none of these qualities appeared and you can touch into the patience and perseverance that you have manifested, you have enacted 
in remaining with the practice as much as you did. So taking joy in that, taking appreciation in that quality of well-being, the blessing that we experience in practice. And there is a way uh, in Buddhist practice that we can um, share that, that we can bring an intention to share the goodness that we've experienced with other beings, with those who may be suffering, with those that we love, uh, who are struggling or who are, we just want to support, uh, with all beings everywhere. And um, it's called dedicating the merit or the blessing of our practice. So may, may the blessings of our practice and our lives, all the goodness of our lives, all the kindness and virtue that we express in our lives. May this serve and support the happiness, well being, and liberation of all beings. So uh, I can show it to you. It's called uh, Eight Mindful Steps to Happiness by Bhante Gunaratana. Are you familiar with that book? Oh, okay. I see you smiling. I thought it was recognition. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be um, referring to this book. I'm, <clears throat> I'm teaching... Um, a course on um, called Life, Loss, and Letting Go um, for a group of people that um, have signed up and the course has begun. And, uh, and we're talking about um, illness and loss uh, in the, and, and framing it in the context of, of the Four Noble Truths. And so this, this book um, is about the, uh, uh, the, the, the fourth, it focuses on the fourth of the Four Noble Truths, which is called the path, um, the, the, uh, the path to awakening. And, um, and I, I really, uh, Bhante Gunaratana, is, is, some of you may be familiar with him. It's, he's not one of the newer teachers. He's one of the kind of, he's, from, he's a Sri Lankan teacher who came to North America. He's, he has a center in, um, in West Virginia. And he's actually the teacher of um, one of my teachers and, um, and Matt Flickstein. Who, uh, who helped him to found the Bhavana Society, who's, which is in West Virginia. And, um, and he's, he's, a really, uh, he's a really wonderful teacher, uh, Bhante Gunaratana. Uh, Matt is also. Um, and, uh, and so um, he has a, a very, he's, he's a very joyful being. He, he just exudes so much uh, joy. And um, and I, I, as I was picking up this book and looking through it, and I thought, you know, he has a really good sense of marketing mm -hmm. because, you know, he's not saying, you know, the four noble truths of pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's, he's saying, the, you know, the eight mindful steps to happiness. So, um, yeah. And it also has to do with 
kind of becoming more aware and understanding of how we perpetuate suffering and struggle and stress and in our lives and where we can look for you know happiness i i don't personally often use the word happiness in my teaching um a lot because um you know it's it's a lovely word and it just it doesn't resonate with me so much but you can use whatever word you know you like uh, could be well-being or contentment or peace um, uh, okay um, audio settings I don't know I just saw Pierre Vincent's uh, suggestion about audio settings um, I don't know if Blakey you could do that what Bla uh, I, I forgot to introduce Blakey she's managing she's supporting this this session she's uh, but if you're able to go in to um, suppress background noise uh, if you but anyway is, is it okay like if I talk this am I talking it's okay yeah yeah it, it's just really warm in here don't want um, it, it's really good actually it's good. You're doing good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not doing okay. good. You're just, we can hear you I'm well. Sorry. Good. Thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So, so, uh, and in, in this book, he talks about, you know, the Buddha teaches about different kinds of happiness that we can experience. And, um, and, and they're actually, four kinds of happiness that that we can experience and so um, so the first kind of happiness and it's you know like he he puts it in a kind of hierarchy but it's kind of the lower kind of happiness but it's still happiness you know and he doesn't dismiss it as not important or valuable in our lives so in, these are things that are pleasurable experiences, like, you know, seeing the flowers bloom, you know, in the spring, like this emerging of life that is so beautiful. It, it creates happiness, a sense of happiness and, and a, a sense of, um, yeah, a sense of well-being and, and appreciation for the beauty of life. And so, uh, yeah, the pleasantness of the motor stopping. <laughs> Silence can be so pleasant. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so these, and he says, you know, there are all kinds of things, you know, uh, they're beautiful things, they're people that are... Um, pleasant to be with, we have relationships that bring us a lot of joy, um, we have uh, perhaps, you know, activities that we like to do, you know, perhaps art or, um, <clears throat> um, or walking. Um, so all of these are conditional. They're all dependent upon conditions. And so, um, so in that way, they are, the happiness is, is good. And, and, and in the teachings, the Buddha encourages people to, um, to appreciate what brings a sense of well-being and happiness and and appreciation um, and also to know that because it's dependent on conditions it's also unreliable it's it, and 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 this is part of the this is one of the the meanings of the buddhist word uh, of the sorry the pali word dukkha dukkha is um 
is a word that has been translated as suffering very often. Um, and, and in the, the teachings on the Four Noble Truths, the first noble truth is the truth of dukkha, that there is, you know, and often it's translated suffering, that there is suffering. So to, to come to recognize that, that we suffer, but it's not just that we suffer like, oh, because I have pain in my body, or I've lost my job, or, um, or I can't see my, my children because of the pandemic, you know, or my grandchildren, or whatever. These are, these are kind, these are painful experiences, and we suffer because we want these conditions to not be there. But even a pleasant experience, like looking at a beautiful sunset, can be kind of tinged and shot through with dukkha, if there's this sense of clinging, and I want this experience to last. Uh, and it's this unreliability, unsatisfactoriness, unfulfillingness, stress. These are all words that are included within the Pali word dukkha. Um, and um, and so, so when we're relying on our happiness, for things that are conditioned, then we, in a way, are finding, uh, uh, are, are sourcing our happiness from unreliable, you know, an unreliable source. Uh, it's not that we shouldn't enjoy it when it comes up, um, and also to know, like, I find that when I know the fleetingness of beautiful, pleasant experiences, in a way, uh, there's more, they're more spacious, and that clinging doesn't tinge it with the that you know that kind of bittersweet quality of oh, I want this to last. If only this could last. And the second source of happiness that um, the Buddha talks about is renunciation. So renunciation is, is actually uh, what I refer to during the guided practice as just the letting go. You know, just letting go in any moment of the drivenness of the mind. Just the letting go of Oh yeah, you know, recognizing this is a thought. You know, I'm worried about this happening, and I don't know what's going to happen. You know, uh, I'm worried about this situation, and and it's coming from fear that I won't be able to cope with it. You know, and maybe I can cope with it. Maybe I can be present. Maybe I have the capacity to step into this, these set of conditions of whether it's a sick parent or whatever it is. Um, so, so letting go, renunciation, is not just about not grasping to pleasant sensory experiences or Certainly not just about you know living a renunciate lifestyle and becoming a monastic, which many people associate with renunciation. Renunciation is is as simple as just coming back to the breath in a particular moment when you when we see that the mind is all caught up. And he said that's a kind of happiness. It's a relief. It's a it's a quality of relief. It's a quality of feeling the space of being unburdened. It's, it's the kind of happiness which comes from recognizing that I don't need to carry this and cling on to this. And then a third kind of happiness comes from the beautiful states that we can cultivate in our practice. And, 
and this, the word for this is samadhi. Uh, so states in which the mind is collected, the mind is not scattered, the mind is centered, that we feel present and at home in the body. One of the qualities, uh, one of the ways that we can cultivate these states of happiness and well-being are through the practice of what are called the Brahma Viharas, the, the, um, the beautiful qualities of loving kindness and compassion and joy and equanimity that are practices of and ways of collecting the mind. And we cultivate it not only as a formal practice, but we can cultivate it in our, in our daily lives by, by just, you know, when we feel you know, judgment or ill will. We can, we can bring compassion to ourselves, and we can bring compassion to that person, or or just friendliness, kindness. Like, oh, that person just wants to be happy, like me. They just want to be free from suffering. Let me open my heart to them. And so these are. This is a way of. cultivating these beautiful states, and there are many. And so, um, and then the fourth is the happiness, the ultimate happiness of Nibbana, of, awake, of awakening. And, and Nibbana is experienced in a moment, it can be experienced in a moment of freedom in a moment of recognizing the interconnectedness of everything, in a moment of recognizing that um, who we are is connected to everything. And so, so there is, um, so this is a, just a kind of a big overview I'm giving for this first session. It's, uh, we're going to go into these more o over the coming months. And um, uh, and and so um, yeah. So I guess that's all I'll say. Uh, and we'll start with just a brief touching on each of the first of the three noble truths, and then we'll explore the fourth noble truth, which is the Eightfold Path. Yeah, so the first noble truth is um, recognizing or understanding that suffering is present in our lives. The second is understanding the causes of suffering, you know, how we want to hold on to things or make push things away. That we, that we don't receive life as it is unfolding in this moment. And, uh, and then the third is, is the possibility, saying, yes, we can actually become free of, this, of these habits that cause us to perpetuate suffering in our lives and the lives of others. And it's... You know, so it's the, this possibility of complete freedom, and it's also a gradual possibility of maybe a little more freedom, you know, as we go along. So, you know, not that it, it's an all or nothing, but, but knowing these, kind of, yeah, this is, I recognize that I'm becoming more free in my life as I develop the capacity to let go and receive life as it is unfolding. So, yeah. So thanks for your presence, my friends. And um, I, uh, as, as we usually do, we can make a moment for those